He said, I gave my comments before. Do you want to do Yeah, I think so. Well, welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here, and I'm really pleased to introduce my colleague and senior fellow, Charles Kenny who has been working for many years on the issues of corruption and governance in low and middle income countries. And his great book that's out today, Results Not Receipts, I think it's a title that tells you exactly what the work wants to accomplish. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Charles, to give an introduction, and then we'll come back and have a conversation. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and indeed, I think that the, the title, which I'm not sure I chose, uh, does indeed say everything that's in the book, so I don't need to talk for very long, which is good, because there are drinks out back. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming. I don't want to speechify for long, partially because there are uh, people in the room who've worked in and around this issue for, for, for ages, and I think there's the, the potential, as much as you can, in a setting like this to have an interesting discussion, um, first in the room and then uh, hopefully out back. Um, but I did at least I want to say thank you. Um, a lot of people in this room have provided uh, valuable feedback on the text, uh, for which thanks, as did many in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and lots of CGD colleagues played a particularly strong role in, in, in making the draft uh, uh, better than it might have been, um, not least uh, my, my co-author on, on some of the work in the book, uh, Bill Savadoff, uh, but also the team that tried to sort of edit and shape the manuscript and, and turn it into something more of a story. Uh, uh, John Osterman, uh, Emily Schabacher, and, and Radish Merchandani. Um, thank you very much to them. Um, and a bunch of other colleagues provided much of the content, um, including uh, Justin Sandifer, uh, who is responsible both for the anecdote that makes up most of the book blurb um, and the start of the book itself. So, so, so thank you, Justin. Um, that anecdote is a story of a, uh, a health project in Afghanistan sponsored by USAID that at about $4.50 per head, uh, four, sorry, $4.50 per head, uh, got basic health coverage to an about 90% of the country. Um, it wasn't the only thing, perhaps it wasn't even the major thing behind an increase of life expectancy of about 20 years increase in life expectancy in just six years. Um, it wasn't the only thing, perhaps it wasn't the major thing behind a drop in uh, child mortality of about 100,000 Afghan kids a year, but it was a big factor in that. Um, and uh, you know, was, a, was in that way a hugely successful development project. However, the Special Investigator General for Afghanistan, uh, John Sotko, um, uh, wanted to shut the pro program down um, because of financial management deficiencies. He had no evidence of corruption, no evidence of wrongdoing, but the receipts weren't in order, so we're gonna shut down, we're, we're gonna try and shut down this aid project. That's the problem that I'm most worried about in this book. Um, a big focus on corruption in the way that aid agencies are set up and the way they run. So the Millennium Challenge Corporation not giving uh, uh, aid to any country that falls below the median in, in their chosen measure of corruption. Um, financing being run through donor capitals without the input of uh, recipient governments, let alone through recipient government uh, systems. You know, worldwide, about 1% uh, of aid is, uh, is delivered, less than 1% of aid is delivered through the go recipient government systems. Um, so a huge movement away from exactly the kind of financing that everybody says is the most effective for development impact. And yet, the evidence that we should be doing that is very weak. For example, um, uh, if you looked in the early aughts at the uh, evidence linking aid and governance, uh, uh, you could plausibly believe that countries that were poorly governed, according to some of the most common metrics of governance available, uh, saw worse aid outcomes and saw no relationship between uh, levels of aid and levels of economic growth. 
Um, it's partially thanks to a, a, a colleague here, David Rudman, um, a former CGD colleague, um, that that evidence has gone away. Uh, uh, he did updated analysis uh, looking at the same data and found no link between measures of governance and aid outcomes. Um, if you look at two experts in the field of aid and, and corruption, and corruption more broadly, um, uh, Danny Kaufman and Art Cray, they pointed out that if you looked at World Bank project outcomes, 80% of the variance in those outcomes is within countries, not across countries. Now, if a culture of corruption at the country level was driving aid, out aid outcomes, you'd expect most of the variance of, it, of those outcomes to be across countries. It's not true. Most of the variance is within countries. It cuts against this story of a culture of corruption being the force that makes aid work or not. The other thing is, it's actually quite hard to find cases of corruption in aid. We all have our favorite examples. I'm not saying there are none. Uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, World Bank finance projects in India in the health uh, system uh, didn't produce the results they should have done uh, because of corruption, the Global Fund, and so on. But going back to the World Bank, if you look at uh, cases where sanctions have been put on companies and, and countries because of discovered corruption in contracts, they add up to less than 0.1% of the value of contracts that the World Bank has issued over the last few years. Now, maybe that's because the systems are working, right? There's not much corruption because of all the layers of bureaucracy we stick on top of aid is actually making, making uh, uh, corruption go away as a problem. Maybe, and I, I hope so, but I'd make two points. One is the systems vary a lot. I'm quite rude about the World Bank in the book, but to be honest, it's one of the best donors when it comes to using country systems, when it comes to providing the kind of aid that everybody says, Paris Accord, Ghana, so on, uh, Accra, and so on, everybody says is the most effective. So if there isn't a big problem uh, with corruption in World Bank finance projects, that means all other donors ought to be moving away from their systems of basically providing money largely within a 50 mile radius around the donor capital to something much more like the World Bank system where most of the money at least at one point actually makes it uh, uh, into uh, the recipient country. Um, and the second point is maybe uh, the, the systems are working. I have to say contractors don't say, say that's true. So if you survey contractors on World Bank projects again and ask does, does all the procurement uh, 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 loopholes, oh, sorry, procurement systems and, and financial oversight, does that reduce the risk of corruption? 15% of them say yes. Um, the, the rest say no. Uh, and frankly, we've never really tried to find out better than just surveying a few people whether these systems work, which is odd because they definitely have costs. They have big costs. They cause delay. They take up an immense amount of bureaucratic time. Um, and if you look at the, again at the World Bank as an example, um, that institution spends way more on financial and procurement oversight than it does on evaluating whether its projects actually have a development impact. That seems a shame to me. So I think we need a different approach. And to go back to the Afghanistan example, I think if you've got an aid project that is playing some major part in reducing 100,000 child deaths a year at the cost of about four bucks 50 a head, you can pretty well say that that aid project is working. And that's what we should care about. We should care about the results. This doesn't mean that I think all aid ought to be cash on delivery, although because this is a CGD event, of course I have to mention cash on delivery. Um, and I think Nancy and Bill's work on this is great. I do think it moves, means moving in that direction as much as is plausible across aid projects, rebalancing from a focus on counting the beans to counting the outcomes. But more broadly, donors really shouldn't be focusing so much on their own money. Aid is a lot less than 1% of GDP of the average recipient country. Um, corruption, as perceived, it appears, is not derailing aid projects, but it's certainly screwing up lives worldwide. Right? Transparency International surveys of, of, of people worldwide suggest you know, more than a billion each year are paying bribes, um, many, many of them to the police. Um, we're seeing whole economies, in some cases, skewed and distorted um, by uh, uh, 
by corruption, uh, by people in high public office stealing vast amounts of cash. And we're seeing horrible crimes committed by government officials high and low, using their office for various kinds of private gain, including sexual favours. So I think we ought to stop focusing on the less than 1% of uh, uh, financing that is coming from aid and start thinking about that much more serious and larger problem. That means support for local transparency international groups that are doing incredibly brave, very dangerous work uh, in countries. It means support for initiatives like open contracting, trying to take the secrecy out of government procurement. Because even if we manage to get to our marketing language around zero tolerance for corruption in aid projects, it would have next to zero effect on the level of corruption in developing countries as a whole. And that's the problem. Donors are meant to be caring about development in uh, recipient countries. And focusing just on their 1% is simply not the way to deliver that. Hey, thanks, Charles. So I'm going to ask Charles a couple questions. We'll have a conversation, but we'll turn it very quickly to you. Um, some of you know who you are, so get ready to ask your questions. OK, so first I wanted to ask you, you mentioned corruption as measured by the number of contractors blacklisted at the World Bank uh, is relatively small. I think you said less than 0.1% of the total portfolio. But is the problem just that these are whistleblowing cases and we really aren't just, we're not measuring very well? Quite possibly. We have a lot of bad measures of corruption and no good measures of corruption, I'd say. Um, or at least we have one or two good partial measures, but no good general uh, measure. Um, so, uh, for example, I do actually think the global corruption barometer, the Transparency International Global Corruption Barometer, that goes out and surveys people, have you paid a, have you, had an interaction with these services over the last year, and did you pay a bribe when that interaction happened, are a really valuable and comparatively accurate tool of a part of the corruption problem and a very serious part of the corruption problem. When it comes to more general indicators, uh, they all have failings. So the obvious uh, uh, failing of the, 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 the World Bank sanctions indicator is not only do you have to find something that's being hidden, um, but in that case, you, you, the World Bank has got to manage to get a level of proof high enough to sanction a firm. So it's surely an underestimate of the problem, and I, I don't mean to suggest um, it isn't. Um, but then there are these indicators that are used by the Millennium Challenge Corporation, amongst others, to decide where aid flows are going, these sort of general perceptions indicators, uh, which are very hard to link with anything very much. And so I think they are uh, 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 poor indicators that the people who've designed those indicators say, not sure they should be used for this purpose. And so that's one of the reasons I think we should focus on results. It's really quite hard to measure corruption because people don't, as a rule, come up and say, yeah, I've just done something corrupt. I paid a bribe aside. Um, uh, uh, but you can measure number of kids vaccinated. You can measure bums in seats with a bit more difficulty. You can even measure whether the kids are learning something when they're sitting in the schools. There are a bunch of parts of a development process that are much easier to measure from a results standpoint. And focusing in on those results and making sure that they're delivered not only means that AIDS had the impact you were hoping for it, but it also means that the, the rents that are available for uh, corrupt actors to take away have been at least reduced if not taken away. If they've actually had to spend the money providing the services that you are measuring the outcomes of, there's less money for them to you know, I, I don't know, uh, uh, spend hundreds of thousands on a, a wedding dress. Or at least that was a story in Angola recently, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. whatever they want to do with uh, the, the, the money otherwise. Well, so what about tracking receipts? Are we any good at tracking receipts? I think we're very good at tracking receipts. We are good at tracking um, receipts. In that there are, you know, you can go to the uh, uh, World Bank servers and find thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of pages of receipt details. You can... Uh, USAID, I'm sure, at the not at the drop of a hat, but you know, at the drop of a hat from a tall building on a windy day, uh, could deliver you a lot of detail on on you know payment financial payments to whom where. They're just very bad at telling you. And did those payments actually make a difference on the ground to you know outcomes to to people's lives, which is after all why we supposedly give aid in the first place. 
So are you suggesting we only do results or we do receipts and results? Um, I would like to do a lot less receipts. I mean, I think this, this is all a balance game, right? So I said that, that I don't think you can get all the way to cash on delivery for uh, uh, all aid projects because some things that aid finances, it's kind of hard to have a good measure of, a good unarguable measure. And sometimes, you know, because of what measure gets done, if you have a poor measure, you might actually have perverse uh, uh, effects. So it's not that you can get all the way to cash on delivery all the time and forget receipts entirely and just rely on an independent survey. But again, moving a long way in that direction, I think, would be a good thing. Or maybe receipts would just be the problem of the government itself, whereas the aid donor would really just be focusing on results. As much as possible. So think about what that would mean for the US Agency for International Development, which I guess most of us know is considering a major reform to the way it does business. What would such a policy recommendation entail for USAID? So if the if the USAID project is to deliver health outcomes in Haiti, it would be around paying for, you wouldn't need to go all the way to lives, you know, reductions in child mortality. That would be perhaps nice, but uh, uh, it could at least get to, it, are there independently verified provision of basic health services, including vaccination and, 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 and care for uh, maternal and newborn care, as it mm -hmm. might be, mm -hmm. all of which, we have measures for, we have pretty good measures for, and you can survey to see if, if those things are being done, rather than paying on the basis of a large contract, usually to a, uh, a, a contractor, as I say, within 50, 50 miles of here, many of whom do good work, uh, uh, but in, for sort of the financing of that and the focus being on that contract rather than the deliverable. Mm. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've found when I've tried to talk about this idea with a lot of the big global health funders is the difficulty in moving away from like a zero tolerance uh, discussion or communication strategy, right? Someone finds a scandal, you have to come out and say you have zero tolerance. So what is the, how would you suggest that aid policymakers speak differently about uh, work? How would they move to results in a way that's convincing, given that there's so much conventional wisdom, as you've said, about weak governance, can't use the money well, et cetera? Um, again, I think focusing on results helps with that problem. The reason for the zero tolerance language being so politically necessary is if you look at survey evidence of why people don't think it's worth giving aid, the answer is they think it goes to corrupt people. So in the United States, the median survey respondent thinks 60% of aid flows end up in the hands of you know, corrupt actors. Um, and that is the excuse for not supporting aid flows. Why should you? It won't deliver results. All the money will go missing. If you can show the results, I think you've got around that problem. No, it can't have all gone into the hands of uh, corrupt person X because we've delivered the outcomes we were looking for. And I think it does help with the, 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 the political saleability of aid in a much more constructive way than language which is trotted out, but usually carefully not very well defined. So um, the, the World Bank and a bunch of bilateral donors say they have zero tolerance for aid, but zero tolerance for corruption in aid, pardon me, <laughs> zero tolerance, someone will probably say that too, but anyway, um, uh, zero tolerance for corruption in aid. And then you, you look at the, the comparatively few, but definitely out there, scandals about uh, aid flows, and, and they're back doing the same thing a year or two later. In the worst cases, quite often they just sweep it under the carpet and, and, and move straight on. So I don't, I don't think the zero tolerance language has plausibility. Um, I do think it sets um, uh, aid agencies up for a, a big problem in the future, which is, you know, well, you, you seem to actually have tolerance for this, look. And it also, again, aid is only a really small part of the development story. And so saying you have zero tolerance for corruption in the financial flow is dealing with a tiny, tiny part of the corruption story, even just involving aid, which is a tiny part of the development story. Because what happens if corruption happens you know, after the hospital is built? Or what happens if the corruption is around um, the, the road, uh, how the road is used, and, and are police charging people to use the road when they shouldn't? Uh, our zero tolerance doesn't extend that far, and that may be where the big problem with corruption is. So we've got zero tolerance to the wrong thing, and we're not even living up to that. Okay. 
Now, reducing corruption might be a development outcome in its own merit or it's mm -hmm. on, on its own terms. And you know, you mentioned a couple of things that aid agencies have supported, like anti-corruption agencies or deregulation or open contracting. How well are those investments going? Mm -hmm. uh, is this an alternative if we care a lot about you know, some of the stories are terrible stories that you've told. I think no one would want to support uh, the, the kinds of things that were happening in Nigeria that Rabadu um, addressed, for example. I mean, surely we want to support those heroes, right, in their fight against corruption as, as just an input to better governance. I, I think we do. I think we've got to be cautious of thinking that that's going to be the answer. I mean, the, 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 the sad story of Nero Rabadu is despite the fact he risked his life and did um, some amazing work in Nigeria, a change of government saw him kicked out. And it's, it, it's, not, it's not a sustainable strategy all by itself, supporting champions, but I, I, I do think you know, when you come across a new Rabadu, you ought to be supporting him uh, uh, yeah. because, I mean, not not least because of his you know amazing bravery in tackling this problem. Um, but I, I do think there is definitely a role for uh, uh, supporting the sort of broader constellation of actors that are, are are pushing forward in this direction. I'll say that as somebody who's been pushing very hard on government contract transparency, do I have strong evidence that it reduces corruption? Frankly, no, I don't. Do I have evidence that it increases competition in bidding? Yes, I do. Do I have some evidence that it reduces prices? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Am I therefore willing to conclude that it probably does have an impact on corruption because it's reducing rents, because it's increasing competition? Yes, I am. But the good news for me is I don't actually have to go that far and say something about the unmeasurable. This thing is having a good impact on things we care about anyway. More competition, lower prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's turn to the audience now. Frank Vogel, come around. Right there. <laughs> right. So you have been invited, <laughs> named, selected for the honor of asking the first question. Oh, wow. Well, I got the first question. All right. My name is Frank Vogel. Hi, everybody. Um, and I think Charles has singled me out because I've actually read the book, and that's probably why, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is a great book, and everybody should read it. And um, my affiliation is that I'm one of the founders of a group called the Partnership for Transparency Fund and another group called Transparency International. Um, OK, I'll ask a question, Charles. Uh, I think that, well, may a comment and a question. Reading your very interesting book, I constantly ask myself, why aren't you asking why the model is wrong in the agencies? Mm -hmm. You say the model's wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what you're saying. You're saying, it's wrong, we should have another. But you aren't asking the question, why aren't the aid agencies asking that? And one of the sad things is that I happen to be one of the group. I was the guy at the back of the line carrying the briefcases. But nevertheless, I was one of five people who spent a whole morning and lunch with Jim Wolfenson shortly after he became president of the World Bank. And all of his vice presidents joined us to discuss whether the bank should even acknowledge corruption was a problem. Why do I mention that? That was the first and last meeting I've ever been to with a World Bank president on that subject of any length. Hmm. Since then, they've known it all. They've never reached out and asked. Hmm. They don't partner meaningfully with civil society, which they could. They could learn from those TI chapters. They could learn from the wonderful PTF projects, and there are now scores of them around the world. But they're not interested. And part of the reason I would argue, and I like your comment on this, is that the incentives in the bank, and maybe somewhere else, are all wrong. People get promoted for shoveling the money out, not for stopping projects. Uh, so there's a lot of lip service paid to corruption. But in fact, in the operational side, far less is really done about it than should be done about it. So the question is, why aren't they asking? You're criticizing. You've got a different model. If I was to write a book, I think I would come out with several different models. <laughs> um, you read the report of the Inspector General for Afghanistan, and he says clearly in his last major annual report that, that aid has actually added to corruption in the country. There are many reports saying the same thing, but still the questioning isn't going on. And uh, 
you've done so much work on this. Tell us why. You've done so much more. Um, and, and by the way, uh, uh, Frank is being kind because it's the launch event. Uh, uh, he had a, a, a bunch of fairly piercing critiques, um, which I want to find some way to share more broadly. But anyway, um, uh, uh, so thank you for a comparatively softball question, which I still can't answer. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I, so I, I mean, I, I agree with you that the, the, the incentive to shovel money out the door is huge. You know, probably even worse in bilateral agencies that run on annual um, budget cycles than it is uh, uh, in, in, in the World Bank. Um, and, and so that pushes against. And it's probably one of the reasons why the responses things is a kind of bureaucratic measures that are the same every time. So it is the, the procurement rules and the uh, financial management rules that you, know, you have a team of people who know how to do those things and do them in the same way again and again and again and again, and you can sort of you, you can draw out your 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 plan of of when the money will actually get there because you need thirty days for this, twenty days for this, ten days for this, fifteen days for that, and so it's it's a it's a safe bureaucratic method to spend a lot of money and look like you're doing something on corruption um, uh, uh, while not risking the fact that you won't actually deliver money in the end. Um, again, a, if one did go all the way to cash on delivery, uh, it's, it's much harder when it comes to uh, financial flows. You know, if you only pay after the thing has been delivered, that could be six months, it could be three years. Um, and so it's much more difficult for a, a large international aid agency to manage its budget using these systems. While I accept that's a problem, um, I don't think it's a good excuse for the current model. Um, and, and we have to think more creatively about how budgeting works, I guess, in, in order to make other approaches uh, more plausible. Yeah, I, I mean, but the, yeah, yeah. And one, thing, one thing we are going to try and do is to bring some of the cash on delivery experiences to CGD to talk a little bit about the issues that are coming up because they're not small, actually. And, and yeah, I have, I have my own opinions on this. I mean, it's not my book launch, though. But um, like one thing people say is that there's double payment, for example. I'm paying twice for the same thing. If they can pay for it themselves, then why am I giving them a prize on top of it? Or can I retain money because of the budget rules one year to the next? Mm -hmm. Or what about the timing of measurement? Because even to go out and measure vaccination coverage, I have to feel the team that would have to be representative. It takes me 18 months. Uh, staff skills. Everyone in my organization works on contract enforcement, and they don't work on providing technical assistance. So it's, not, it's actually not a small ask that we're making to uh, the organizations like USAID or the Global Fund. But it is worth going farther in that direction. I think w as we begin to hear more stories about how this is working, what are the real life issues that come up, we can understand how to make this work more practically and, for people. And right? large World Bank finance procurements, mm -hmm. both, con uh, both of, uh, of uh, technical assistance and of staff, um, take way over a year anyway because of the procurement rules. Yeah. So you know, yeah. you, you're spending a lot of time one way or you're spending a lot of time the other way. And I think I'd rather spend it on hiring surveyors. But Yes, I agree. I agree. OK, next question here on the left. Please yes, say your Martin, name. Martin, 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 Richard America at Georgetown University okay, great. School of Business, uh, where we teach business ethics to MBA students and others. And I'm on the board of something called the African Society for Business Ethics, based in Ibadan, Nigeria. And the idea is simple, maybe simple-minded. Teaching business ethics, we believe, can matter. But that gets to old-fashioned ideas of honor, integrity, honesty. So is it naive, in your judgment, to think that teaching business ethics to managers and bureaucrats and decision makers can make a difference. No, I don't think it's naive at all. And indeed, I mean, I think norms really matter in this area. And one of my worries is that if you signal that you expect there to be corruption, and this is not just my worry, there is experimental evidence that this is true. If you signal that you expect there to be corruption in a, in a country or a society, um, firms and businesses feel less bad about uh, bribing somebody. Everybody does it, right? And so creating and, and enforcing uh, the norm that one shouldn't be corrupt, I think, is a hugely important part of the story, absolutely. Okay, next. 
here in the middle. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I work in um, anti-corruption efforts in the private sector. So I'm just curious, I mean, broadly speaking, I agree with sort of your premise here, but at the same time, a lot of funds flowing through for the private sector, they have to worry about FCPA, UK anti-bribery laws, anti-money laundering laws to the extent that any global financial banks are then touching that money. So how do you sort of balance that very heavy and sometimes overly burdensome level of compliance on the private sector and banks, and then say at the same time, well, when it comes to bilateral aid or multilateral aid, we're going to apply a slightly different standard, but still expect sort of corruption to not escalate in certain areas. And I don't know if that's it. So, no, it's a, a, a tough question. I haven't thought enough about a uh, 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 private sector um, compliance with F F FCPA, and I would love uh, uh, to hear other other thoughts. Um, uh, I, again, um, a lot of this is uh, CYA is the acronym, right? Um, the, the, uh, if, you've, if you've ticked all of those boxes, if corruption happens, but I ticked all the boxes. Um, and and I, I think it's a bigger problem in a way for the private sector because we've, to some extent, created the incentive to tick all the boxes and stop. Um, and I don't, I mean, beyond sort of back to the earlier thing of, well, well, no, try and make sure there's not corruption because it's bad and, you know, it should be against your norms. I don't actually have a, an answer, but again, as I say, it's not something that I've, I've thought too much about. So, John, back here, I'll come to you next. Yeah, Charles, I absolutely agree with your thesis, and it, it feels right from kind of the real world that we absolutely obsess over receipts. Um, when I worked at AID at one point, uh, a poor staffer had been held hostage for a period of time. There was a lengthy discussion uh, once he was freed over whether he could claim per diem or not. <laughs> uh, and part of it hinged on the fact that he didn't have receipts. So if you are taken hostage, get receipts. Keep the receipts. Uh, okay. Good tip. Good but tip. I'm wondering if you would be willing to apply your thesis more broadly. The idea that we focus very much on corruption within aid flows and really overanalyze it and scrutinize it without looking at the broader social picture. Uh, looking at the trends in development more broadly, do you think we're at a point now with so much focus on transparency, accountability, evaluation, that we are scrutinizing aid to death without paying a whole lot of attention to what's going on in the societies that we're trying to help more broadly? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Good answer, Charles. No, um, no. I mean, uh, uh, certainly, I, I think we are, we are too concerned about aid flows, quiet aid flows. We, we're going to be somewhat, right? And if you are the head of an aid agency, of course you're going to... That is and should be part of what you do. Um, uh, but my worry is, you know, to what extent. And the more, at least, that the things that aid agencies do are designed from the outset to be things that we think recipient governments ought to be doing or governments everywhere ought to be doing, um, we're going to happen to try doing them in aid first, the better. And so, you know, again, to come back to my favorite anti-corruption intervention, uh, uh, publishing government contracts, I am fine with the USAID, frankly, pushing uh, for that to happen first, both you know, with its own finance contracts and with contracts uh, uh, that it finances that are actually run through, through governments. Um, I'm, I'm fine with it using that lever to increase transparency with the hope, expectation that it, hope and expectation that it'll go, it'll go across government as a whole. Okay, here in the front row and then we'll... I'm not looking over here. Did someone raise their hand on this side? Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Prem Garg. I used to be at the World Bank. I was the director for quality assurance. And one of the things which we really grappled all that time was in defining quality, the bringing the balance between the results side and the fiduciary side. You know, how do you balance those uh, two dimensions? Seems to me that uh, in the uh, this 20-year period uh, since uh, Jim Wolfenson brought 
the corruption into the mainstream, you know, this seems to be now coming full circle. Because prior to uh, acceptance uh, of corruption as a developmental issue, I mean, you know, for 30, 40 years of development by multilateral agencies, corruption used to be almost a dirty word. You would not hear a single mention of that. But uh, it's not uh, clear to me that uh, because nobody was focused on corruption at that time, we produced better results in that period. You know, so if you took the longitudinal view of it, have uh, uh, we delivered better results uh, in the past 20 years or what we used to do in the previous 40 years, that would be a one benchmark to judge whether or not corruption really matters, mm -hmm. because that's a sort of an indirect experiment of uh, what uh, uh, might be done. Now, my, my sense is that uh, really the development community as a whole did go overboard. You know, it's a pity that uh, uh, while on the one hand in the World Bank, and I did it 10 years ago, so I don't know whether that's the current situation, uh, you know, there is a massive erosion of substantive technical skills. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a massive buildup of fiduciary, and I should add at that stage uh, also the safeguard mm -hmm. uh, issues, you know, so almost the whole agenda seems to be dominated by, in some sense, uh, the, uh, really the tail begging the dog rather than <laughs> dog of results uh, driving the agenda. Uh, so, you know, that, that uh, clearly uh, would suggest that a new rebalancing is needed. Uh, I, I don't think it's a question of uh, results or receipts. Mm -hmm. Like you rightly hinted, uh, I think it said should be results with receipts, and there <laughs> one would have to be more selective and more judgmental in terms of where the receipts matter more and where they matter less. It's not that, you know, every project and every instance you need receipts. And same way, there are situations where receipts do matter a lot. You know, you, you can't uh, ignore them. So what would be really helpful is uh, rather than uh, arguing that uh, uh, there is no or little linkage between receipts and results, it would be more helpful to specify when is there a linkage between receipts and results? What kind of situations, what kind of projects, what kind of development efforts uh, can be done uh, with uh, little of this uh, fiduciary uh, focus? And what are the projects where you do need uh, this sort of a thing? You know, for example, uh, one of the thoughts which often comes to my mind is it's not the corruption per se, it's the predictability of the modalities of corruption. If you can plan around it, probably the development impact can be uh, really salvaged and managed. But if uh, it's a totally unpredictable mm -hmm. way of doing corruption, then you have a more of a problem. Yes. So um, I, I agree with you. It can't really be about uh, uh, just results and never receipts. Um, uh, this is a snappier book type, although. Um, <laughs> results and receipts. There we no. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, an important point. I, I'm not sure what the right metaphor is. I'm not sure we went overboard. Maybe we got on the wrong boat or something. Um, uh, uh, and, and partly, I'd say it's because we didn't, we didn't go as broad as we could and probably should do when it comes to what we're thinking about when we say corruption. I mean, so there's the public office for private gain definition that you know, the, the bank uses um, broadly, amongst others, um, which is a perfectly decent definition, but I think when you, when, well, at least when I read the TI surveys, uh, the Global Corruption Barometer surveys, my sense of what people are answering when you ask how corrupt is Institution X is broader than that. And, and for a start, I think that because they think it is meaningful to answer questions like how corrupt is business. Well, business is an in public office, so you know they must be thinking of something a bit broader than just public office for private gain. And I think they're right. I think they're thinking about the system skewed unfairly against me or the majority of people. Um, and that brings up the issue of politics, which, of course, the World Bank can't officially discuss because it's against the Charter and is a really important part of the story when it comes to why outcomes are the way outcomes are. Um, and so, you know, rather than thinking that we went too far in our discussion of corruption, I think in some ways we didn't go far enough. We, 
we focused in on we donors uh, focused in on on the part of a story that was kind of more comfortable to deal with, where a bureaucratic solution of, of more procurement experts and financial management experts could at least give the appearance of doing something, and ignored some of this bigger picture stuff, uh, which is, is is more political. But. I'm Judith Edstrom. I was at the World Bank, but more recently director of a very large USAID local governance project in uh, Indonesia. And I know how annoying these uh, the minutia in terms of counting receipts for numbers of photocopies and so on. Mm -hmm. But I did. Uh, it raised a red flag when you mentioned the USAID project in Afghanistan. You know, for 450, they vaccinated X number of kids. Well, fine. You could bring in a whole team of expats and jab. A bunch of kids, but and you know you might get high vaccination rates. But what's the outcome? In other words, linking pro results to projects or projectizing results is a great challenge because can it be sustained? However, the the some of the things you refer to about in building government capacity to do these things and that this what I considered was a very good, well-designed local governance project for more open budgets and the kinds of things we did. Uh, are much harder to measure. And they're not only harder to measure, but attribution becomes extremely difficult in governance compared to vaccination or those kinds of numbers. Uh, but they're there for the sustainability. So, uh, you know, and you know, the whole doing development differently seems to be, you know, looking at local context and going back to kinds of things that those of us as practitioners always thought made sense. But they are not either or, Agreed. and they are results more broadly than a, a specific project can so, implement, in my opinion. I mean, one, yes. Uh, and, and again, that's why I think this is about moving along a spectrum. You can't, uh, it's implausible to imagine moving all the way. But two, um, uh, aid agencies are in the lucky position of not having to fund everything. They, they aren't governments. They can, never, they can never replace recipient governments. Again, in the vast majority of countries where aid is given, they are a teeny part of, of you know, the economy or of uh, funds spent on stuff. Um, and so in a lot of cases, they can choose not to fund the stuff that is difficult to um, uh, measure results for. And I'd be in favor of that approach. That said, again, um, I, I do think that, you know, uh, a, a, I would, I would love to um, take 10% of the money that is currently spent on World Bank procurement and financial management and give it to local TI offices in developing countries. Right? The, I, I think there are, there are things we ought to be doing, which I accept you can't measure easily on a results um, uh, basis, um, and that, that uh, aid agencies ought to be funding. I think they just ought to select those things very carefully and make sure, in particular, they're things that the government wouldn't do anyway. Um, which is one of the reasons, you know, things like transfer, things like supporting civil society are things that local government probably wouldn't be doing anyway, and so at least you have that sort of guarantee of you're not just doing the, the same thing as the government would with different money. Um, so that's where I'm most comfortable. If you know, if it's not about something where you can measure results, if it's something where you know the government isn't going to do it anyway, then I feel safer about spending spending the aid that way. May not have been terribly good. Uh, Maya? Oh. Thanks. Charles, Charles is a colleague of mine, and we work on gender issues. And on gender, in, in gender issues, there's always, they say, culture, you know. I, I've seemed to realize that you're saying the same thing with corruption. Can you sort of elaborate a bit on? culture and corruption and how you go about it? Yeah. Um, um, uh, I, I, I worry about the idea of a culture of corruption, um, at least widely applied across countries, um, because the measures we have for what they're worth suggest a, a large amount of variation within and between. I'd say the same about uh, culture and gender, which is when you take the World Value Survey, as it might be, and you look at answers to questions like, do women make as good political leaders as men? 
the variation within countries is almost as large as, the, I mean, sorry, is larger than the variation across countries. So uh, in, in country X that you consider to be incredibly uh, sexist and probably is on average more sexist than other countries and probably outcomes are worse for women, there are still a lot of people in that country who have uh, gender equal attitudes, if you will. Um, and so, you know, I, I, thus I worry about uh, a culture of a bit. Um, but I do, do think culture matters, or at least norms matter. And, and, and changing norms is possible at every level of uh, income per capita across the world. It doesn't have to wait until, you know, you're a rich developed country. We are seeing that in gender. I think uh, we will see that in, we, we, sorry, and we can see that in corruption too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, instead of follow up, yeah. go ahead. Uh, mm. My name is Martina Bon. I work with FHI 360 and before that AED. So I have some interesting experiences in this. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful about conflating the review receipts and the culture of corruption. And the anecdote being a small project in a country in Central America where it was cheaper to pay the project director's wife to cook an excellent meal for a conference than to pay the caterers. And it was an honest, genuine belief. They got much better food this way, and it was cheaper for the US taxpayer. And so it's, yeah. they're not necessarily married. The US perception or the multilateral lending perception of what corruption is versus what true corruption is. No, I think, yes. Um, it's and, an important and, distinction. <laughs> and I mean, so an, another thing that comes out of a uh, global corruption barometer indexes is, is people in rich countries think their police forces are much less corrupt than people in poor countries do. People in rich countries think that their political parties are more corrupt than people in poor countries do. Um, and it's not that we're talking about the same type of corruption. It's not government ministers stealing money you know, at a massive scale that they're talking about in rich countries. It is, again, back to this kind of perception that the system is stacked against um, and, and the political parties are only in, working in the interests of elites. So there's, there's, there's sort of... The, the definition of what corruption is, is is very much in the eye of a beholder, which is you know, perhaps not, not surprising. Um, which is not to say, and I don't want to go too far into the, so nothing can be measured, so we know nothing. Uh, uh, um, but I, I, I mean, I, I accept that you know, the, the corruption we ought to be caring about, as well as, I mean, sorry, the corruption we ought to be caring about is the stuff that matters to results. Um, because if, in this case, um, uh, uh, the better meal was served for lower price. You know, it is a bit hard to see the victim there. Okay. Uh, ah, now, now I've made Frank okay. angry. <laughs> you in the front, then we'll do Paul, you, Frank, and then we'll end. Uh, Tom Timberg, uh, consultant. I wonder if you could, looking at the, we've been involved in aid in some fashion for and maybe we'll say since 1945, so that's uh, you know about 80, 90 years. Uh, what are the circumstances in which foreign countries, by providing assistance, have been able to produce results <coughs> and have been able to reduce uh, or assist to reduce corruption? Where? Which country? Okay. Where? Let's collect, okay. shall we? Um, right behind you. Right behind you. That gives you time to think of an answer. Hi, my name is Christina Araby. I'm with Security Assistance Monitor. Um, we're currently doing a project on um, looking at um, U.S. security assistance and military aid um, and the potential that it will fuel corruption. Um, and I was wondering, how do you come up with recommendations based on you know, whatever um, risks you've identified um, for donors that actually <laughs> that actually make sense or that actually mean something? That's not like collect your receipts or um, make sure you're monitoring exactly this or 
what kind of recommendations um, mm -hmm. I guess, would you recommend? <laughs> That's great. That's a very interesting topic, Paul. Thanks. Uh, I'm Paul Eisenman, uh, now a you know, consultant. I thought I heard you say that um, donors should only give money or should mostly give money for things countries would not have done themselves. Would you accept as a friendly amendment that that means doing more, that means doing better, uh, as well as doing something different? And if you wouldn't accept that, are you implying that what you said earlier about kind of supporting government systems and non-project type aid, that you, you didn't really mean uh, <laughs> that? And did you also mean to imply, which is partly in response to the last question, that principles like government uh, ownership and um, accountability, mutual accountability, uh, and sustainability don't matter very much. So I'm hoping the answer is yes, that's what I meant. So can I, can I take them in reverse, yes, reverse order? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, one, I think it's unfair to ask me to be consistent across 50 minutes. Um, two, uh, what? I think, <laughs> um, I, think uh, uh, I think most aid ought to go to developing countries on the basis of results. If you can't measure results, um, a good way to make sure you're not wasting aid is to spend it on things that governments wouldn't be doing otherwise. So I want most aid spent on the basis of results um, through country systems and all that, uh, uh, and you know, forget the receipts. Uh, the bit that isn't, I like most of that spent on things that the, the government wouldn't. But I, I would, so it's a kind of the the third option, if you second, third option, uh, if you will. Um, when it comes to security aid, again, not a topic um, I'm an expert in. Um, I I take the money as a weapon system crowd at their word when they say they're using money as a weapon system, i.e. they're trying to win a war with it. Um, so I guess you, you, you measure the success of that stuff by, well, have you won the war yet? Um, and uh, if that is the criteria you set, I would say that it's not working very well. Um, but at the more local level, I, I mean, I guess it's sort of it's it's almost number of soldiers shot, right? Um, or or you know, number of security in, in, incidences. Um, I have tongue in cheek suggested before that we ought to pay by results uh, for for that. Um, I don't actually think that's probably workable and might have some fairly hideous uh, 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 unintended consequences. Um, but you know. <laughs> I, I don't quite know how else one would measure beyond number of security uh, incidents because I think you know that's supposedly what the money is about, and and so if that's that's why we're spending the money, let's measure its success yeah. on on that basis. Reduced IED. Thing. Re reduced IED. <laughs> yeah. I, I that thought, was Justin's project. Uh, um, uh, and and mm -hmm. sorry, I, you see, I can't remember three questions. Uh, the third one is to give an example. Oh, of... where, 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 where? Yeah. Well, so I mean, you know, we, we all go back to the the, the Marshall Plan, uh, the smallpox vaccine. Um, uh, great new book by Ethan uh, Capstan on uh, um, USAID funding land reform in South Korea as being, you know, a a a, a basis of, of of the tremendous growth in that country. Although I will say that I, nobody, I think, would argue that the tremendous growth in South Korea, at least in its early days, wasn't accompanied by some fairly gargantuan corruption. Um, so it may not be a, a, a good model from that point of view. Um, one of the problems with uh, uh, the aid and anti-corruption field is because we don't have very good measures of the level of corruption, it's, it's hard to figure out what's worked. Again, I come back to measure the things you can measure, and um, if there's a plausible story linking it with corruption, I would declare success. So, you know, if it's a procurement intervention, uh, a number of bidders and prices you're paying, uh, if it's a, 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 an intervention to reduce um, uh, uh, corruption in schooling, you know, are the teachers turning up? Are they teaching something? Maybe are there learning results? Um, and so, uh, I would look to the interventions that have achieved on those outcomes 
And if there's a plausible story that one of the mechanisms was through reducing corruption, I would say, let's do more of that. OK. Frank, you started. You can end. Oh, there's one person. Before I go back to Frank in the back, somebody? Pointed Casey sitting alongside me yeah. by asking an additional question. I apologize. Uh, Dan Honig, uh, Johns Hopkins Sice. Um, I had a question. So we've talked a couple times about kind of the balance between results and receipts. Uh, and I was wondering what we knew about the sort of revealed preference for that trade off. So that is to say, do we have any experimental evidence on risk aversion inside these agencies? Will people trade $100,000 for? a hundred bucks of corruption or a hundred bucks of unreceded activity? Do we have sort of revealed observational data over a range of projects that lets us get it, some kind of lets us back out an estimate of that kind? Um, and if so, how would you anticipate that interacting with the visibility of outcomes, which it seems to me is the observable implication uh, of the model you've put forward here? Thanks. So okay. I'm, I'm, let's I'm let, going, Let's let Frank ooh. end, and then we'll come <laughs> back to you to wrap up. Okay. Did you want to say something? Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the problems with the book is that <laughs> there, is, there is not enough of a connection between grand corruption and petty corruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many of the things that you're talking about this afternoon refer to specific projects that refer to basically uh, seeking to reduce corruption to reduce poverty uh, in many communities, in many countries. Um, there is never widespread petty corruption unless there is grand corruption. And you don't really address this in the book. Uh, and aid agencies don't adequately address it because the people who are responsible for the grand corruption are also their shareholders and some of them sit on their boards of directors and so on. Uh, but that means they're handicapped. So that's the first point. The second point is um, there's very little mention in your book of victims, even though you just mentioned the word. For many people who answer the barometer questions, and the Afrobarometer is perhaps the best of the global barometer series the TI has ever done, and it was done in a very different methodology in the last time round. Um, many, many people say, look at the word corruption and say theft. Mm -hmm. They're not looking up great political systems and being screwed by some distant political party or something like that. They just see theft and extortion. And it really isn't very hard if you go down to the project level or the community level and look at hospitals in certain places or schools or other things like that to find the theft. And then you have to ask the next question, which again, I don't think you adequately deal with in the book, where's the justice systems? Why aren't, you know, you talk about results, but how can you have good results in countries which have such terrible systems of justice and law enforcement? And I don't think you've dealt with that. And my final point. Okay. Last one. Because I'm being polite. My final <laughs> point. And because time is running out. I disagree with the opening sentence of your book. <laughs> the opening sentence of your book reads, it's very short so I can read it. Governance and corruption remain at the heart of discussions around yeah. global development. Mm. I don't think they do. Some colleagues of mine had enormous difficulty getting the word corruption into the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Ultimately got in there as number 16, although some people thought 16 was already too many goals. Um, I think this subject, there's a lot of lip service paid to it, but I really don't think it's seriously discussed by any, to anything like the degree you suggest here which may be part of the problem of the whole issue. Nevertheless, I challenge even your first sentence. <laughs> OK, thank you. Good last comment. Uh, Finish. I think I agree with some of that uh, <laughs> and disagree with other bits of that. Uh, uh, so but again, I think it comes back to um, uh, um, what we are talking about. What we're talking about, and it is a problem with corruption that, that, that there are so, so many different definitions. I don't think you get those global corruption barometer results saying a lot of people think the media is corrupt if it's all about theft at the local level. I just I, I don't see how you get there. Um, so I think they are thinking about broader issues, and I think they should be for exactly your first point that, that um, you know you don't just get petty corruption without somebody further up making money from from it. Um, uh, and you know, 
There's lots of experimental evidence out there about how much people are effectively paying for a government job because they know that there'll be a future stream of rents coming from it. So, you know, I, 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 I absolutely accept that point and think that, so I said, um, and I don't think donors talk about enough about politics. I, I guess we're both heading in the same direction, that, that this problem isn't, isn't one just of sort of bureaucrats taking 5% off a, a, a construction contract. It does go up to the top, and it quite often goes up to the top in ways that don't involve direct theft, but definitely involve uh, skewing the system against the interests of poor people, and that sucks, which is why, if I can quote a different line from the book, um, I say, I don't think we should care less about corruption. I think we should care differently about corruption. Excellent. Thank you so much, Charles. I invite everyone to read the book. And now, uh, libation and uh, fun. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Thanks.